what would be the, the biggest policy mistake right now? Oh, gosh, that is a really tough question to start off with, Francine. Thank you. I, I know. Um, no, no icebreaker. I think that I think the tough I think the toughest uh, thing the, the the biggest mistake would be for them to to rush to do anything. I think uh, a lot of what we've seen has been even by the standards of some of these high frequency indicators uh, surprisingly predictable. Uh, I have I have to say, especially after seeing these Korean export numbers. Uh, a couple of hours ago, I have never seen anything quite like it from the indicators I've followed for 30 odd years. Uh, astonishing cyclical recovery going on. But when you sort of stand back from it, whilst it might surprise people that aren't um, more used to, you know, this kind of intensity of, of high frequency changes, I, I think the policymakers should be careful about rushing to what many in the markets are, are trying to persuade them that it is now a done deal that underlying inflation is back. Obviously, the very latest readings we had in the US suggest it could be, but, um, you know, one month is one month. So, but I, I, that said, I think the it heightened attention on as many anecdotal indicators about wage behavior and, and, and with it pricing behavior by co companies to make sure they've got a handle on the inflation expectations process is crucial, absolutely crucial. Uh, you know, I, I, I remain unsure myself whether we are seeing a real pickup in inflation or not, and it, it could be. But uh, uh, yep. clear, what is clear, another, th another three months, say, of, of this intensity of global recovery, and central banks are going to have to start thinking about uh, reversing their easing. No two ways Jim, about are, are, it, if, if it stays like oh. this. If it stays like this, but it, what is the danger that we're underestimating actually how effective vaccines work longer term or variants? Or do you think we're pretty much, you know, it's hard actually being in the markets because we're not virologists. And so it's difficult to see <laughs> how this kind of, you know, where it ends up. Well, the answer to that is nobody knows, Francine. Uh, you know, even though we're 18 months into this pandemic, each twist and turn, uh, it, nobody knows quite what happens. They still don't know, for example, here in the UK, what is the virulent strength of this so-called India, or now rechristened as of this morning, the alpha vaccine, uh, alpha variant. Um, it looks to me, and, and as you know, I'm quite involved in some of this health stuff, so I'm following a lot of the numbers really closely. It looks to me as though after an initial scare about 10 days ago, the, the rate of increase in overall infection in the UK is leveled out. But, you know, that's just on the basis of the last few days. But I think, you know, here we'll need another week or so. The UK in some ways is on the cutting edge of, of countries to follow because we've mm -hmm. had such a very large vaccination rate. And this variant seems to be more uh, evident here than in other countries, at least from what I can tell. So I think by uh, the beginning of the second week of June, when the British government will decide about opening up more, we, we will see pretty clear signs whether this uh, virant, uh, vi new virulent spread is, is, is causing a lot of damage or not. But we'll have to just keep having an open mind, as one always has to do yeah. about a lot of information. So, Jim, what do you think that the market should be looking at? I mean, apart from inflation, which I imagine is 90 percent mm -hmm. of their time, if not like 100 percent, is there something else? Is it, you know, not volatility, but liquidity that we should worry about or something else that makes you uneasy about the summer months? Well, I, I, I tuned in to catch the, the intro to you or the end of the previous discussion and the intro to yours that, um, you know, it is it is quite clear within sectors of the equity market, things have got a lot more volatile. And uh, if we see a fresh bout of nervousness in the bond market, then that's going to create issues about liquidity as well as more vol volatility, because it is the time of year that we go through. No, nobody's ever fathomed out quite why you have this regular thing every every late spring going through the summer. But uh, I have to say I have some sympathy with it this year. And, and even though the overall S&P index managed to eke out a small gain uh, in May, it probably didn't feel like that to many managers because it was just so volatile. And 
you know, we've got we've got a tricky couple of months coming up because it does look to me as though as these indicators are going to be extremely strong around the world. And uh, marginal central bankers will be shifting from being uh, as friendly as they were. And it, it's not impossible that they might start to send messages about some sort of preemptive, uh, they wouldn't call it tightening, but removing of, of the scale of liquidity. So it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be challenging. But at the end of the day, focusing on measures of in, inflation, and as I think I, I made reference to in the piece you cited, something that I believe for a long, long time, that the, the five-year University of Michigan Inflation Expectations Survey in the US is highly powerful yeah. in terms of its durability and its its true reliability. So I'm going to be watching that. 